Now, you're very welcome back. So I'm sure you've seen the uh, news at this stage. Silvio Berlusconi has passed away at the age of 86, Italy's uh, longest serving post-war leader, prime minister on three occasions, and of course, AC Milan owner for 30 plus years as well. He died in uh, Milan Hospital. He had been fighting leukemia in uh, recent times. An extraordinary life in many ways. And to uh, tease it out, and give us uh, his thoughts. Gab Marcotti, I'm very happy to say, is with us. Gab, great to have you on. Great to be with you. A general reaction in the Italian media to Berlusconi's passing? Um, well, obviously, uh, he had so many dimensions, right? Um, there, was a, there was a football sphere, there was a media sphere, there was a construction sphere, and, and then there was a political sphere uh, as well. And... He was exceptionally polarizing, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that, you know, he he really dominated um he dominated Italy's consciousness probably from and was hugely relevant, goodness me, from for at least thirty years, from the mid eighties until the mid twenty uh, tens. Um, you know, and even even today, even very recently, he he was still active in, in politics, although not as important as before. Just to um, briefly chart how he arrived in the 1980s as such an influential person. 1930s, as I've been reading, and I, I didn't know a lot of this um, in advance of talking to you, but uh, born to a pretty well-to-do upper middle class Milan family. His father is in banking. It is in the 60s, Gab, where he really makes his fortune. The Italian post-war construction boom is kicking off. And Berlusconi, uh, clearly, uh, you know, amongst many failings, I'm sure, which we can come to, is a very smart man and is a force of personality and he makes his fortune. Yeah, I mean, I think originally... He did it through construction, um, but I think where it really went to the next level um, was he was just an exceptional salesman. You know, he gave off this this image of modernity, this image of success, which you know now maybe looks a little bit dated. Um, and so he he started building both residential and commercial uh, properties around Milan and around the north of Italy. What took him to the next level was um, he did something that was very clever. Uh, in the late 70s, um, Italy, like other European countries, um, essentially uh, deregulated um, television and allowed for private investors to own local television stations, but they were not allowed to own national television stations. The thinking was that um, you know, would give people too much influence and so on. So what he did at the time was he he bought a local station in Milan and then bought other local stations um, throughout throughout the country. And he basically got them to broadcast the same shows at the same time. So ostensibly, these were all local stations and they had local lo- logos in, in Milan and Turin and Florence and whatnot. But they all had the same shows on at the same time, which means all of a sudden the stuff that he was putting out there had a national audience and that allowed him to sell national advertising rather than just local advertising. And that really put him on the map. And then he he quickly acquired other major networks um, and he became essentially, you know, the biggest um, commercial television provider uh, in Italy owning owning three of the six biggest networks and the other three of course were were all state owned and this presumably makes him unbelievably wealthy right man right time because i was reading his fortune at the time of his passing is estimated at seven billion um which is you know extraordinary uh, figure so this makes him enough money to buy milan this makes him major player in italian life in a whole host of ways yeah i mean he um it, it's really funny because he um or funny interesting um he became really wealthy i mean i'm skeptical about all those lists about what somebody's fortunes is whether it's elon musk or the forbes list of clubs or whatever but he's obviously very wealthy um he made certain choices in that time which everybody around him said were the wrong choices um his closest advisors the first one um 
because people said these are going to be po polarizing, right? So, well, the second one was going into politics, which everybody said this is really, really bad because you'll you'll anger half the country, and he did. Um, the other one was was buying AC Milan, which he did. I want to say in 1986, yeah. I think. Um, the idea being, wow, all of a sudden, you know, you're going to alienate fans of Inter, fans of Juventus, fans of, of rival clubs. Um, but he was very smart in, in the way he did it um, because he said, I'm going to turn Milan into an aspirational club. You know, I'm going to shake European football, not just Italian football, to their to their foundations. And he poured a lot of money in and made some very inspired choices. People people no doubt remember his first Milan sides with Sarigo Sacchi as the manager and Marco Van Basten, Franco Baresi, Ruud Hole, um, Donadoni, Maldini, all those guys. But what he also did was he kind of realized that football's entertainment and so many of the things, and they may rub traditionalists the wrong way, but that we take for granted today that are part and parcel, for example, of the Premier League, um, these are things that he wanted to do then. Everything from, you know, having names on the back of shirts and he wasn't allowed to do that to um to to merchandising having shops you know having club shops selling team kits um and, and a whole bunch of of other stuff just simply with a club logo on it uh going on tours uh, around the world um you know he took his milan team to asia to north america to south america um really building the brand the european super league um he was the early proponent back in the 1990s with the media partners group um he he really really pushed this side he really pushed the entertainment side he, he talked about how he didn't want his team to win he wanted him to be attractive um and you know this was this was a really really big part of of how he saw the game and there are some people who believe that had he stayed more engaged in Milan and not gone into politics, um, you know, he would have revolutionized football even more than even more than he did. So in '86, he is still eight years away from becoming prime minister. He will win uh, under his stewardship five European Cups. Milan will win their first ever Serie. A. You mentioned uh, Saki, who of well, course it wasn't their first ever Serie. A. They they'd won it before, but it was their first Serie A title since 1979. Oh, sorry. OK, I must have misread that. I thought it was their first in 100 years or something. Uh, no, no, no. OK, well, something of a famine. You mentioned uh, Saki there, who's famously plucked from Division One at that stage, like the, the second tier Italian football. Um, is Berlusconi, beside, you know, very much behind decisions like that? And, and also, uh, he has talked about or I've read that he was genuinely innovative, not just on the commercial side of football, as you've outlined, but also in how a football team should be prepared. Like Milan, we know about the, the lab, of course, uh, I think very famously at this stage. But, you know, right off the bat from the 80s, there was cutting edge innovation on Burley's yeah. part. Is that fair? Oh, 100 um, percent. You know, you mentioned Milan Lab, which is basically, you know, again, Today we take these things for granted, right? Yeah. Back there, back then, sports science was very much in in its infancy. So he created uh, a whole sort of sports science uh, department. He he had psych sports psychologists there who were present. Um, they he he was the first person to, or one of the first people to have the con whole concept of something like like squad rotation, for example. Which again, today we take for granted. But I remember one season, you know, he almost played a different 11 in league than he did in the cup competitions. Um, the idea to keep the players fresh. Um, he, at one point, he decided that it was really important to learn from other sports. So he acquired a rugby team, a volleyball team, and an ice hockey team. He put Fabio Capello uh, in charge of, of all three. And he said, right, you're going to learn these sports and how they work, and you're going to learn what can be then applied to to football. Um, and like, it's not like all these ideas worked out, and some of them didn't. Some of them were, were frankly, with hindsight, foolish. But he always sold them as brilliant ideas. I mean, he was exceptionally, exceptionally charming. And at the time, 
people thought, you know, everything he touched really turned to gold. You know, he really had this Midas sense of excitement and innovation and, and, and so on. And, you know, and this was at a time when most of the rest of Europe was very much in, in and most of the rest of Serie A as well, of course, was very much in the dark ages. Uh, to what extent then was he an overbearing presence in the years of Saki and Capello? Pick him, do it that way, play this 11, then that, that 11. Oh, he was definitely very, very present. Um, really, I think right up until the late 2000s, he was very, very much involved. He loved getting involved in, in, in transfers and, you know, talking to uh, officials at other clubs personally and, and to players personally to try to convince them to come. Um, he, I mean, I've gotten to know several Mina managers who worked under him in, in that era very well. And some of them are aligned to him politically. Some of them are most definitely not. But all of them said, you know, he was always there. He was always, he always wanted to know. He was always part of the conversation. And, you know, he's actually pretty knowledgeable. You know, he's not, he was not a fool. Um, certainly, and certainly in those years, he worked very hard to try to, to try to stay abreast of everything. You know, he liked the personal relationship with, with the players. Um, later on you know it probably led to some poor decisions um but at that time in the 90s i'd say it was probably an integral part of of his success yeah uh did he have a favorite team if you you know the saki team the capello team and then that that last blast with ancelotti no i think his favorite team was would be the 88 89 team that you know they they won the european cup which we then hadn't won since 1969 uh, that team beat Stal Bucharest in the final 4-0. Um, but I think, and I stand to be corrected, but I think what, what impressed them was the, the semifinal against Real Madrid. They won 5-0, five, five mm -hmm. different goal scorers, uh, including Carlo Ancelotti, um, but also, Van, uh, I think, I'm not sure about Van Basten, but, but Ruth Hollett scored, Donadoni scored. I mean, it's just, a, it's just one of the great dominating one-sided performances between between European royalty. Yeah. And I think that would probably be his his favorite team. Am I right in saying he serenaded Rude Hullet when he was trying to sign him? It's entirely possible. He early in his career, now it's true that he was born into money and is obviously but you know, it's not like it's not like his dad was a billionaire. Yeah. His dad was a guy who worked in a bank and could approve loans and he always prided himself on on working. And so I think it was while he was at university, he he worked on cruise ships, and one of the things that he did in the cruise ship was, and and he does have a very nice singing voice. Um, you know, he he essentially sang. He did, provided evening entertainment for for extra t extra tips, and um, and was a was a favorite of the of the older ladies apparently. You mentioned then politics. So from ninety four on, he's prime minister. I'd be curious to get your sense of this because <laughs> I've seen it said obviously down the years to what extent did they intersect in his decision making over buying players selling players because I don't know where causation and correlation come in but certainly you, you, they would pinpoint certain signings or certain players being sold with regard to when the next election is coming up were, were these things uh, intersecting to that extent? I don't think so um because, you know, by that point, you know, I mean, we may be a little backward in Italy, but, you know, we're not totally in the Stone Age. Um, people recognize the, the, the people who voted for, for Berlusconi early on, or many of the swing voters, were former Christian Democratic uh, voters. Christian Democratic Party had been in power either by themselves or in a coalition since the end of the war and they were in that power they were in power essentially and i don't think i'm saying anything controversial here because the second biggest party in italy was the communist party we had the biggest communist party in europe uh, look at between 30 and 35 percent of the vote and for for obvious reasons during the cold war um there was this fear that they were just never going to get into power nobody would form a coalition with them um you know that's what happens when you're you're part of NATO and part of the West, and there's a Cold War, um, and the Christian Democratic Party being a very very broad church, um, 
like a lot of like other parties, fell victim in this massive corruption scandal. And he was seen as the outsider coming into politics to to clean things up. Um, the guy who was socially very, very centrist, um, even politically, originally, he presented himself as kind of more free market oriented. But I think a lot of that kind of went out the window um, pretty early on, and he just became kind of like a populist. Uh, I think effectively he was a populist centrist and who later on formed alliances with some people who, in my opinion, probably a little bit unsavory um, to the right of him. Um, but but that was kind of always always his message was sort of this very folksy message. He was really never driven by ideology. I think his critics would say, you know, he was driven by the fact that he had so many criminal proceedings against him. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's still 15, 17 open. Um, I, the, sort of the wheels of justice grind very slowly in Italy. And he remained in politics to gain different forms of immunity to be able to to kind of slow the proceedings against him down. Um, that's the I think that's the general yeah. perception, certainly from his critics. Well, circling to politics in a moment, just one last one on Milan then. Sells the club in 2017, does very well out of the sale. Uh, that last decade, by comparison with the first two thirds of his tenure, are awful. What happened? I think, well, this is the thing, right? I mean, as great as he was in the first part, I think the wheels completely came off towards the end. I think he became so enmeshed and so embroiled in in his political affairs and his legal affairs that either, again, his fans would say that, oh, well, he couldn't look after Milan the way he wanted to. Um, his critics would say, no, he still got involved with Milan. It's just that he was old and made stupid decisions. Whatever the case may be, for me, then it was kind of like a lost decade. They accumulated, they, they, they weren't good. They they accumulated a lot of debt. Um, and ultimately, he he sold the club. And he sold the club to, I think I can say this, I don't think he's going to sue us, one of the worst possible actors out there. And there's still a lot of question marks around the sale. He sold the club to this uh, Chinese investor named Li Yong Hong, who... You know, even back then in the era of Chinese billionaires, few people in China even were familiar with him more. And few said, yeah, he really is a billionaire. Um, he did well out of the sale in the sense that he sold it for, I think, 740 million euros, if memory serves. Um, that included about 200 million euros of debt. Um, however, this fella, Li Yong Hong, um, as it turned out, he only had part of the money, so he he was able to. I think he paid about two hundred million. The rest he had to borrow, which he borrowed from an American uh, hedge fund called Elliott Management. And then this guy Li Yong Hong eventually defaulted, and when he defaulted because he put me on up as collateral, Elliott um, took over the club, um, and by all accounts have run it very well since then. So there's still this mystery about why he sold to Li Yong Hong. Where did Li Yong Hong get the money? Even the initial um, 200 million that he did pay back to Berlusconi. Obviously, the rest he borrowed. Um, but again, that was that was a really really poor decision on his part. Um, and again, now he's. I think personally, I think it was just just old age distractions with other things, yeah. um, just wanting at the end to get out. Yeah, and the last one on his like, relationship with Milan. Did you get the sense that for the majority of his time owning the club, he was one way or another watching every game? There was like a childhood fan aspect there. There was still a sense oh. of wonder, or had it very much become just a play thing and a touch more pragmatic about it all? Oh, no, no, this isn't Sheikh Mansour. Um, this is a guy who showed up to almost every game, was always very happy. He's always he's always been very good with the media, very, very accessible. Um, and I think he also loved to talk about, especially after entered politics, he loved to talk about Milan because, um, you know, I meant he wasn't talking about politics or his legal issues or, or, or whatnot. So 
Um, no, no, no. I, there's no question that, you know, I think even his biggest critics, and he's got many massive ones, mm. will tell you that what he did for Milan, he, you know, he did because he was a fan. He was a fan from day one. Mm. He really, really loved the club and the players who came through it. Um, he didn't do this out of self-interest. Had it been out of self-interest, he would have gotten out of it many, many years before he did. Okay. On the uh, political front then, so Prime Minister for the first time in 94, he would lead three governments. Uh, 01 to 06, he came back and by Italian standards, that was a long stint. I think that those five years had been the longest uh, since World War II. And then he was back again, 08 to 11, obviously, uh, world in crisis around that time. Another comeback in uh, 17 attempted and ended up in the European Parliament in 2019. So there's a Teflon uh, quality here. I did see the Italian Prime Minister, uh, Giorgio Maloney, said he was a man who was never afraid to stand up for his convictions. As you've alluded to, I haven't seen a single other person talk about Berlusconi as having an ideology or having convictions. Um, like I, I read the criticism this morning that his dealings with the far right completely, you know, the, the charge is very fair to say he completely reopened the door to neo-fascism in Italian politics and normalized it and legitimized it and embraced it for um you know, his, his own selfish uh, reasons. Uh, to be fair, I, I, I can't see a single redeeming aspect to his politics, Gab. Uh, a lot of people feel the way you you do. Um, I'm not <laughs> I'm really allowed to give political opinions, but I mean, just say I can completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I think in terms of, of what he actually said and, di- and, and did, um, I think your characterization of he opened the door and legitimized, um, you know, what's known in, in Italy as kind of the post-fascist, right? Because fascism by law is is illegal in Italy, although there's obviously people who, who uh, and then fascist gestures are illegal in Italy. And although there's obviously people who would probably privately identify as fascist and would embrace that. Um, yeah, there's no question that you know he he formed an alliance with 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 them. Um, I think there's also a lot of people, and I think many in Giorgio Meloni's party who who would say that they're just as disgusted by forming an alliance with Berlusconi as people elsewhere were disgusted with Berlusconi forming an alliance with them because you know this is a guy who had a ton of legal proceedings against him, everything from. I mean, you know, people joke about Bunga Bunga and Ruby and whatever, but even before that, we're talking about bribes, we're talking about racketeering, we're talking um, some of his lieutenants striking deals with, uh, with with mafia figures. There's a whole host of, of things that, you know, he was charged with. And one of the selling points of the far right, probably because they'd never been in power, um, was that they're not corrupt, unlike the the center right parties, unlike Berlusconi's party, unlike the center left. Right? They've always kind of claimed that you know, well, we've always been untouched by corruption. That was a big part of their appeal. So, yeah. I think it worked. It worked both both ways. Um, would would the right have risen had Berlusconi not been around? Sadly, personally, I I think they probably would have. Um, I don't think there's any question that. He he supercharged and legitimized um, some of it. When you mentioned the corruption, so again, without having the lived experience of Berlusconi day to day, but just following international news, I think your average person would have a sense of, oh yeah, there's a lot of smoke there and the bunga bunga stuff, and there was the tax fraud conviction in 2012, and you know, there's there's a bit of you know business going on there and that's just the cost of politics. I completely underestimated the extent to which this guy was up to his eyeballs in corruption. Like, compla- So we reckon over 20 years, 2,500 court appearances in 106 trials. I took 106 trials in 20 years. That's good going. I mean, I think me and you combined aren't getting there, uh, Gab. So I mean, like this guy, He's just up to his eyeballs in shady yeah. dealings at 
every turn. I mean, like it, it is, it is kind of extraordinary the extent to which he's a complete precursor to the the Trump school of politics. I hadn't fully appreciated it really. Obviously, he's Teflon. I mean, hundred hundred and six tri- six trials and, and three stints as prime minister. I, I was wondering at what point you were going to bring up the Trump parallel. I, I think it does fit in some ways. I again, I think to Trump there is an edge and a nastiness um, which just don't fit Berlusconi's um, the way he projected himself. You know, uh, whether it's policies on on immigration, policies on same sex marriage, or what and and, and whatever. Um, obviously, it didn't happen at his time, but you know he, and he would he would always felt empowered to crack jokes, which I think are, are probably like, unacceptable and offensive. But he never pursued policies to to that regard. Um, okay, so but, but the, I think the, his defense, the, the Obama nice suntan or the Merkel and uneffable lardars, uh, these are gaffes as opposed to in Obama's case, like um, signs of a racist. I think in, I mean, to me, it certainly um, appears like something that's racist and unacceptable. Yeah. Unacceptable to, 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 to say. Um, but, but his policies weren't of that. But thing. no, I don't, I don't think he pursued any, I mean, certainly relative to, to what would come later and to what has come now in Europe. Um, okay. I don't think, he, I don't think he pursued any policies like that. He just thought that all this, all these, you know, he's also came from a, you know, this is a decade ago as well, and he was old. And yeah. I think maybe I'm not sure mentally he was as sharp as he was before. Um, but I, I think that is one of the differences between him and Trump. What, right. like, the, the other common thing, but which he always maintained, was that the he had political enemies, and he had a ton of political enemies um, with good cause, some might say. And they weaponized the courts, the courts against him. Um, and I think, and so therefore, he had to have all those lawyers. And that's why you said 106 trials, because he painted this picture of all these magistrates who were obsessed with bringing him down politically. You know, he railed, I, I always said it was hilarious and, and kind of pathetic, you know, even if you said 10 years ago, he railed against, oh, the communists are trying to get me, the communists are going to get me, blah, 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 and communist judges. And I'm like, what communists? You tell me in Europe, where are you going to find any communists? You know, it's like, dude, the 1970s are over. You know, you can call it the laugh generically. Um, so we're still stuck on these kind of, these Cold War tropes, which I think, to me, made him seem pretty ridiculous when he spoke about it. But, um there was always that dynamic yeah he he was convicted of a bunch of crimes other there's there's a whole bunch of other crimes that he was accused of uh which you know the statute of limitations expired on um because he would get he would get elected he'd have immunity and then the statute of of limitations would expire and i to me the single i remember thinking this uh there was a movement in italy saying you know what let's just strike a deal with berlusconi we give you immunity you're not going to be prosecuted for any past crimes, current crimes, even future crimes. But you just go away. Go away because you've done your damage, you've had your impact, and now you can go away and the country can move on. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people who who felt that way. Um, then there's no question that I think this this obsession in dealing with him in a situation which got out of control, um, no doubt, harmed harmed the country for many years and um, my memory of the bunga bunga controversy and it is just memory but I, I think i'm on solid enough ground is that certainly over here and i think on on uk television it was the and finally story there was a wry look at times bunga bunga is a funny term and it was like well you know this is boys will be boys and, and look what he's after doing. It's amazing uh, sensibilities have changed so quickly and, and, and quite rightly so in, in so many areas. That bunga bunga thing is far less harmless through this prism now when you consider you're talking underage escorts, 
and I don't know who else was a guest at the house hanging yeah, out with no. uh, Sylvie on Friends. Like it, it is, um, you know, grubby and, and these kind of terms don't go far enough. Like I, I wonder to what extent in Italy it's seen as, as shameful. Is that being revisited, that chapter in his life at all? I think in the immediate aftermath, when, when somebody passes, um, sure. rightly or wrongly, there's, you know, that stuff kind of gets a little bit overlooked in I the, the incident you're talking about um with uh this girl named Ruby who who was underage um it's it wasn't just that it's that so she was one of the people who was present at these bunga bunga parties um there was a situation where I can't recall if she was arrested or she was stopped by the police or over something and Berlusconi just picked up this is a very bad going thing to do he picked up the phone and he told people that he's <laughs> he was general mubarak's granddaughter because she's moroccan and mubarak's egyptian right. and so therefore we need to hush the whole thing up you know um it's this kind of stuff it almost feels like amateurish like a joke but like i think ultimately it's a question of what resonates with people right a all those 106 trials that you mentioned, maybe one of them was for Bunga Bunga, and that's what people remember. And it's unseemly and unsavory. And all the other trials where he wasted or embezzled uh, or was convicted of, you know, embezzling tens of millions mm. of taxpayer money, that's less sexy. So that's less important, right? It's almost the same thing with I live in London, right? I mean, we had a prime minister here named Boris Johnson who, you know, <laughs> in the end, what did him was having parties during lockdown, which on the grand scale of all the other things that he's been, he's done and been or been accused of doing, um, probably seems relatively mild. Yeah, you get Al Capone on tax, which brings us to organized crime, I guess. Did he have a stable hand from the mafia? So, yeah, so this story is, he, uh, this is a bizarre story and it's one of those things, at some point, in the 1980s at his house, he had, he had horses um, and kind of the stable master who looked after them was a man named uh, Mangano, who, who was a convicted mobster. Um, I think he'd served time in prison. He got out and he hired him. And again, the accusation was that he was somehow some sort of back channel um, way of communicating with the mob so that so that the mob would leave him alone. Um, I I genuinely don't know the reality of that. I, I personally think that anybody who was involved in real estate in the 60s and 70s at some point mm. would have come into contact with mm. major organized crime and the fact that he often got away with it. Um, but, you know, there's also other situations where mobsters trying to extort money from him you know put bombs on his construction sites and uh i think i i think this was also there was also a context in the early 90s or the mid to yeah it was after the murder of two anti-mafia uh judges uh falcone and borsellino there was a point in the late 90s when there was an alleged um I, mean, I say alleged because I think most people assume that something happened, but we don't exactly know. There was an alleged peace treaty or an attempt at peace treaty between the state and, you know, via um, secret service uh, agencies and the mafia to kind of resolve the situation where the mafia would continue to run certain things, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't go after other things and in exchange the the state wouldn't go after them um again to what degree he had knowledge of this or he was involved in it uh, i don't know that that we're ever going to know yeah uh to matters less important i guess uh, your sense of him as a person because uh there's obviously a vanity there the makeup the hair uh, oh. I, I'm pretty sure he's not oh. tall as he as he looked from afar on, on tv I'll as give well. you a better one okay uh, I, I'll never forget this. This was 2007 in, in Athens after Milan won the Champions League final against Liverpool. Mm. This is the first time I, I'd seen him before, but I hadn't really noticed. But, you know, he he sort of came through the mix zone afterwards, shouted to journalists, and 
And I noticed he was wearing these sort of boots that kind of looked like women's boots in the sense that, you know, with a really, really high heel, but like absurdly high heel. <laughs> this is always a huge point of vanity with him. Mm. Um, and I, it was to the point, I mean, they weren't stiletto heels, obviously, but I almost wonder, like, how do you manage to walk in those without developing, developing a backache or, or whatever? I mean, they were clearly the sort of lifts that, you know, made him a good two to three inches taller. Um, but but that was part of the presentation, you know, the, the double breasted suits. He had his um, he had hair implants at one point. So then as a result, like he had to wear a, a bandana for for a couple months and people people mocked him for like there was no tomorrow for that. And he obviously had all sorts of plastic surgery since Botox, goodness knows what else. Um, you know, that was always, but, but in some ways that kind of fits, right? Yeah. Because he's the big salesman. Um, and he thought he needed to look good and he thought that made him look good. And he thought that that kind of emphasized his message. I couldn't, I obviously I can't understand him in his native tongue. Was he an impressive orator? Like was, was part of his appeal that he could hold an interview and, and convince and connect or, or, or what was he like in public in that respect Cap? he was generally charming and funny um very very warm very folksy um you know he he always kind of um managed to you know tell stories that would resonate with an audience i i i very distinctly remember after he formed an, um, a coalition with what was known as a National Alliance, which is one of these right-wing post-fascist parties, um, there were a lot of people in, in Italy's Jewish community who, as you can imagine, were were very uncomfortable with this. Um, and I remember him, you know, giving giving a speech where you know he talked about it was either his mother or or his aunt who was um she was imprisoned by by but by, by fascists for helping you know a jewish family uh escape um during the war um you know all these stories which you don't know to what degree they're real or not um but he always had a knack i mean honestly if if he were here in my place he would talk to you about Leo Varadkar, or he would talk to you about the wolf tones, or he'd talk to you about, and you know, I know I'm pulling out Irish stereotypes here, but he'd pull out stuff that he thinks would resonate with you and with your audience, right? He he had this knack for connecting one-on-one -on -one with people, which which I think a lot of very good um, politicians, mm. very good orators um, undoubtedly have. Uh, it's all very interesting. Uh, did he, uh, his final years, did he die a content, happy man? Happy with his legacy? Happy with how he did things? Or did he feel like I got screwed over every which way? Put it this way. He would never tell us right. if he was unhappy at the end. Um, you know, certainly the way you go through it. I, I, I was really struck. Uh, he was married twice and then he had sort of different um, companions after that. But I'll never forget his second wife. Um, after she left him, just kind of talking about the man he was, in in an extremely powerful, heartfelt, negative way. She gave a was almost like a, a soliloquy on on, on on television, and and you realize like how much darkness there was um, because. If you strip away, I know it's difficult to do the politics and you know the the criminal convictions and the trials and all this stuff. You really have a guy who, for the last thirty years of his life, was basically just surviving mm -hmm. and going to whatever lengths he could to survive. Um, and he created a situation for himself. Yeah. And that was one of the main accusations I think she was she was throwing out against him. Um, 
and that was that was very powerful um you know equally you can find all sorts of things about him that are you know probably rude but which seemed funny and childish in a very simple way there's this famous incident of i think it was the g20 where they all line up it's on youtube your audience can check it out they they all line up to take a to take a picture um and you know it's all the heads of states obama's there berlusconi's there and the queen is there because i think it was it was in the uk at the time and i mean this is the queen elizabeth right and Berlusconi is somewhere in the back and he wants Obama's attention, right? And you can hear him he's shouting at Obama as they're taking the pictures, like, Mr. Obama, hello, how are you? Come here, Mr. Berlusconi. And you can hear the queen saying, what is it? Why does that man have to shout? Except <laughs> I can do the queen's accent, right? Um, there's, another, there's another famous incident where he and Angela Merkel are meeting at some summit somewhere i think it might have been in 2009 or something where kind of you know they all drive up in their big limos and then they have to go into whatever fancy building is supposed to go into he gets out of the limo and instead of going inside he goes and he hides behind a column and then angela merkel shows up and starts picking her way and you know he like jumps out from behind the column to like surprise her like like he's a child but he's a 70 year old man right yeah. like that kind of stuff charms people and makes with certain people it makes you forget all the other dark stuff that that marked his life god that was great i think that's a pretty good 3d um effort at trying to get to what berlusconi was all about thank you so much no problem cheers gab marcotti uh with us on the line talking silvio berlusconi who was passed away at the age of 86 amongst other things ac milan owner for 30 years